This is Enzo from OKEX, and you're watching Breaking Bitcoin. Passionate, passionate. Welcome back to Breaking Bitcoin. We are live. Today is Friday. Let's kick off the recession with a beautiful Friday show, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully, you're doing absolutely fantastic wherever you happen to be tuning into the show from and wherever you happen to be geographically. We've got a fantastic show for you today. A lot to talk about. Uh, news coming out this morning. Wirecard UX has been ordered by the FCA to freeze customer funds. So the rolling Wirecard issue, um, which affects predominantly one of the most popular crypto projects in the space, um, MCO, uh, is uh, is not just relegated, uh, is not just relegated. Because previously, previously, kind of the narrative was, no, 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 listen, this isn't going to affect Wirecard UK. This isn't going to affect anything. Everything's totally fine. Uh, buy it right now. We're going to moon. And now the narrative seems to be slipping quickly. Don't believe me? Go check out their Discord. But, you know, we're going to we're gonna look at the possibilities. It's quite possible that in the long run, this is a good opportunity, right? MCO down about 30% from its high. So certainly just looking at numbers and looking at percentages, those looking for an allocation that we're kind of feasting at around 550 or so, not a bad, you know, kind of entry level, uh, you know, allocation, not 10,000, maybe 450, right? And then we just see how more drops. But we'll go over that, go over kind of the pros and the cons. Uh, obviously, market's slipping a little bit this morning, but putting in a bit of a recovery over the last hour or so uh, off of, uh, you know, a a as normal, right? The Federal Reserve saying anything, saying anything, uh, saying that, well, you know, hey, if we have another COVID outbreak, banks are going to have a hard time. No, really, really fed. Re you think that... You think that financial institutions will have another hard time if we have another extended pe period wave of lockdowns. What you really mean to say is that, hey, guys, if we institute another level of lockdowns, uh, everything is going to suffer. We're going to have another deflationary event. We're going to have another market meltdown, most likely worse than the one that we saw in March. But at least here in the United States, uh, when I look at what's going on, I feel like <laughs> I feel like policymakers are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because they have to be sitting there thinking like, OK, listen, this coronavirus thing is starting to get bad again, and maybe we should go ahead and lock down again. But we already had people locked down so quickly and so fast with so little well-managed coordination that they were starting to burn things and riot. And what are they going to do if we institute another level of lockdown? So perhaps... You know, they have to choose the worst of both evils, right? Let people die due to coronavirus or let the country burn. So they're most likely going to choose the latter eh, because they're not, you know, terribly good at making decisions. That depends on what side of the coronavirus argument that you fall on. However, however, we got a lot to talk about. So um, let us move right into the show. Uh, if you guys have any questions, make sure to drop them in the chat. The moderators are there to help you and not there to bite you. So they are uh, just be nice to them and they'll be nice to you. Um, before we begin, as always, today's show is brought to you by the Cracking Cryptocurrency Premium Trading Group. Check the link in the description, premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com. If you would like to join our community of professional traders, learn from us, build your own objective data-driven strategy, take advantage of our premium indicator suite, as well as our premium signal service and trade alerts, uh, and so, so, so much more. Our, uh, our community, everything. It's all listed there, premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com. Let's get going, guys, into the mainstream. Here we go. Okay, and here we are in the live scene. Yes, it's Friday. I am wearing my, uh, my, my tropical apparel. Okay. By the way, question of the day. Is anybody else shooting off fireworks where you guys are? This is just maybe a United States thing, right? We've got the 4th of July coming up pretty soon. And it is starting earlier than it normally does, right? It has just been fireworks all week. I kind of feel like we're being shelled. Okay, just maybe just me, maybe just me. Okay, uh, so here we are. Let's take a look at the broader market. Obviously, as I said, S and P. Most major indices are slipping today. S and P down about fifty points, down one, one almost a little bit more than one and a half percent. Nasdaq down one and a half percent, one hundred fifty-two points, and the Dow down about two percent so far. Uh, the DAX and FTSE. Let's just equal those out and say they're both down about half a percent. All right. Um, currencies. We of course see the Dixie. Oh, the Dixie was moving up. The Dixie's actually fallen here in a little bit over the last hour. This was up quite a bit today, uh, which we normally see when the market starts to slip, which was good for my uh, for my dollar uh, for my for my dollar trades uh, in the Forex currency pair. So 
not too okay, but overall just, just roughly here at break even. Let's look at our futures and see if gold and silver are in play today. After initially slipping, we do see gold and silver surging back to the upside just a little bit, but not broaching that 1% mark so far at of current time. Uh, oil is down almost a percent. Natural gas has not blown down, has not continued its uh, rapid descent as of yesterday. Oil was, um, oil in, in my opinion is actually poised. I think oil is still in play. Uh, but slipping just a little bit. But natural gas, which was falling right off the curve. And what's funny is I saw a lot of charts on TradingView um, talking about like setting up long-term shorts. And I'm like, you guys realize that we just had like a multi-massive mega volume move down into an order block, right? Like this is not the time to do anything. This is the time to take profit and consolidate. But, you know, I, I digress. I digress. Uh, cotton chilling up almost a hun uh, up almost 1%. And Bitcoin, at least as far as the CME features are concerned, are down 1.39%. Looking at crypto itself, we see the majors beginning to take a move when Bitcoin initially put in its bearish movement starting this morning. Uh, we Again, we do see Bitcoin spot down here a little bit less than 1%. So about half of what the CME futures are down. Uh, we see XRP, USD up almost a percent. Ethereum down 1%. I think Ethereum is going to continue to slide here moving forward. We'll break that down when we get into the analysis. Uh, Bcash has been actually doing pretty okay, but pretty much stuck in its consolidation zone. So those hodling BCH right now are just still hodling BCH. It hasn't made its big movement yet. Uh, EOS and LTC are putting in respectable movements. EOS actually selling back down some of the gains that it put in this morning and Litecoin still holding its gains pretty well. So the majors are beginning to take a move. We saw liquidity flow out of Bitcoin and uh, initially didn't go into Tether. It went into other altcoins. So uh, perhaps the majors are finally going to begin putting it in their plays. And we do see yields on bonds down quite a bit. So prices are up, which is actually a little bit more scary to see than, than the opposite. So. Uh, overall, just what I need to take away from this is that so far it is a regular Friday, seems to be a regular profit taking day. We've had some negative news. This wire card thing is no joke. This does affect quite a bit. This is a huge scandal. Um, and, you know, one of the funny comments, too, is that obviously so, so wire card is the issuer of the MCO cards and um, for for them to be. Uh, for them to, to, to essentially be bankrupt and uh, most likely be going into bankruptcy. And and then now in the UK, having their funds, uh, having the FCA order them to freeze customer funds, which does not lead to good things. Uh, this is this is pretty rattling. And what's really kind of interesting here is that the malfeasance does not come from the crypto side. The, the, the malfeasance came from the traditional banking side. So once MCO, which I think is a good project, went to... Uh, established their, uh, you know, their their planned rollout and contracted Wirecard to be the issuer and payment processor of the cards. Excuse me, well, Visa was the payment processor. Then that's when the malfeasance came in, right? It came in on the side of the traditional banking uh, system and not on the side of cryptocurrency. So this entire narrative that crypto is shady and only for criminals, I think is 100% juxtaposed incorrect. The traditional banking systems are afraid they're going to clutch onto power. This is going to be a long battle between sustainable sovereign currency and the right to your own money, the right to be your own bank, and the uh, the imposition of economic slavery upon individuals, which is uh, what we call having a traditional bank account and paying taxes. So let's hop into the main scene here. Let's actually start off with classical TA. I thought we'd start off with classical TA today. Uh, you know, I I was uh, I was I was buffing up my classical TA chart today, just refining some of my lines, seeing where we're at. So this was previously. Let's look at the weekly here. Uh, this was previously not a pretty yellow line. This has been here for about four weeks now. Uh, this was actually just a paint drawing down, and then I kind of circled this area. But I just made it a little bit more clear to show the current order block. Uh, and it's really not an order block. It's an area of liquidity that we're most likely moving towards here on the macro. As I talked about before I left on vacation, I didn't really reference this when I came back, but I said that most likely within this 10-day period, we were going to see resolution of what most are going to be calling a formation, uh, which is the current price pattern or the current price action that Bitcoin has been putting in for the last several months. Um, indicative of, con well, it is consolidation. It is range bound. It is low momentum, high volatility, which are two different things, momentum and volatility, two sides of the same coin, but very different sides of the same coin. Uh, just as volume and volatility are often two sides of the very same coin. And, um, you know, everybody kind of get, really gets their tassels out whenever we enter. You know, people are fine if we're moving in a straight direction. People are fine if we're, you know, moving in a straight direction up. People tend to be fine if we're moving in a straight direction down. People are very prophetic. People are, are putting out charts. And then when we enter into range bound consolidation, we have a few problems. Individuals are A, optimized or their strategy is optimized to work in trending markets like mine is, for example, and like the ones that I teach our students. So they don't do very well 
and ranging markets. And because they don't have the discipline or the patience to trade higher time frame setups, which sometimes means you wait for several weeks for a trade setup to present itself. You know, there's a lot of issues, right? It's not easy to trade higher time frame, um, to trade higher time frames. And I understand this going in. So, you know, I want to take I, I want to take a few moments here to just speak to, I guess, you know, any premium members or any individuals who are watching this or just anybody in general who might be struggling with trading higher time frame setups and might have had trouble in this consolidation range or in previous consolidation ranges. Obviously, uh, areas in my recent memory that stick out to me where I noticed that a lot of individuals, not only in the chat, but also members of the group or new members of the group and and just people in general that I communicate with in the realm of trading. Uh, expressed having difficulty or experiencing loss in their trading activities, right? So the the areas that come to, to mind in recent memory are, of course, going to be this recent two-month consolidation period that Bitcoin has been in, uh, this area right here, uh, this area right here, which uh, this Jericho candle, I know, for certain wiped out a lot of individuals. Uh, and previously, I remember probably the worst area for people to trade in recent memory was back in the 2018, 2019 lows when we were down at 20, um, excuse me, not 25, but, but around, but around three to 4,000. So that, those are difficult times for people to trade. Um, and a few, uh, you know, a, a few things can happen, right? Remember trading higher time frame setups and taking objective, for example, let's say daily or weekly signals takes patience and time. You have to wait for your confirmation. You have to wait for your setup to emerge and you have to go with the trade and you have to be patient for it to play itself out. This can often take several days. This can often take a week. This can often take several weeks. And it's going to take time for you to get to your take profit target. And you know what a, what a lot of people will do is, is they, they wanna be tuned into the markets. They want to jump on every kind of quick rapid candle movement or volume spike or chart that's posted or YouTube video that they see. And they, they think that, you know, they're, they're going to be late or they're going to miss the movement. And so they begin maybe going down to lower time frames and looking for setups there. And and what they end up doing is they absolutely will miss that higher time frame setup that they had carefully planned, carefully predicted, uh, laid out. And we're ready to trade. The only the only pl place where they messed up was not their analysis, was not their idea, was not their construction of their trade game. It was the patience to just wait and trade that setup, which most likely would have made the money, maybe quite a bit of money. But instead, they, they felt the need to descend down into the lower time frames to be in a trade because they've heard that that's what a trader means. And they're seeing all these people on TradingView and on Twitter and in Discord post these amazing looking trade setups or entries. And you are not that person. You will never be that person. That person is not there to pay your bills. The only person at the end of the day that's going to pay your bills, that's going to execute your trading plan that pushes your agenda is you. That's it. It's you. And, and if you are lucky enough, which I am, and most of us are here watching this, to be in a community of individuals that, that think like you, trade a similar system to you, have similar methodology to you, then you are very, very blessed because you have a community to rely on for support who basically speak the same language that you do. Because in the world of trading, most people don't speak the same language. People tend to use the same words, but they do not speak the same language. Everybody interprets a chart differently. Everybody's discretionary system is different. Everybody's, you know, subjective analysis is going to be different. You know, what a, a bullish indicator reading to somebody might be a bearish indicator reading to somebody else because of this and that and the correlation with this and maybe the size of this candle or the shape of this candle or that volume spike or this volatility movement or what this indicator over here is saying. So at the end of the day, this is what we focus on and what I find to be the most conducive thing that will help you trade your setups and actually help propel you to make more money and lose less, which is trade your setups, get off social media, talk to people who speak the same language or similar than you, and do not let other individuals, um, interpretation of price or markets or fundamentals influence your game plan, right? You have to, I mean, I, we say this so many times, it's a cliche, but it is true. Plan the trade, plan the trade, trade the plan. It's your trade, be patient enough to take it and ride those swings, right? Ride those swings. And when the market that you're trading isn't conducive to your trading strategy, well, you shouldn't be getting signals and you certainly shouldn't be going down to lower time frames to hunt for signals with a strategy that you know you have not tested and therefore have no business trading. If you have not done 
the back testing, the forward testing, and the live trading to know that your daily strategy and daily indicators work on the four hour, and you send me a four hour chart setup, I am going to yell at you. If you, uh, if you are, if I know that you are engaged in building a daily time frame setup, and you are currently back testing your volume filter, and you are sending me 15 minute charts and talking about scalping in the members lounge, for example, you are not you're you're not pushing your own agenda, right? You may think that you are. You may think that you're being profitable and you might be in the short term, but you are actively working against your long-term success. I've seen it hundreds and hundreds of times because I've mentored I mean at least over a thousand people in the last 4 years since I've been doing this. And the biggest biggest most common mistake I I see all the time is people refusing to have the patience to trade the daily, the weekly, the three day, and moving down to the four hour, down to the 30 minute, down to the five minute, trading the latest indicator that they just saw on their favorite uh, YouTube channel, uh, looking at the latest signal, looking at the latest triangle that their favorite, U their, their best crypto Twitter influencer just published. And it's it's silly, right? It It's not how professionals do things right um maybe it's because we're stubborn maybe it's because we're cocky or whatever it is i don't know but 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 it, but it works we develop our own trading ideas we don't let others influence our our thoughts or our emotions even though we're susceptible to it of course but we you have to identify the problem and then take steps to mitigate that problem moving forward so for example if you notice that every time you go on to crypto twitter you end up entering into a scalp Get off crypto Twitter, get on there less, right? Uh, there is, uh, it, you know, I, I, so I have like a couple Twitter accounts and lists. Uh, obviously, we have the main Twitter account, and it's useful because, um, you know, I, I enjoy like communicating and talking and and posting stuff out there and getting our message out there. But if you look at like my um, curated lists of the stuff that I actually follow on my tweet deck. It's mostly fundamentals, right? Like I follow a lot of market economists and, you know, like COVID researchers and uh, philosophers and people who talk about like morality and economics. That stuff interests me far more and honestly informs me far better, right? Looking at the, the, the best trade setups and charts out there, it doesn't make me money, man, right? So when, when you see people post charts, I don't care like how accurate it may be or how how good of a trader that they are. Looking at somebody else's chart um, is probably not going to make you a better trader, right? What's going to make you a better trader is having a plan. For example, like the plan we lay out in Pathways to Profit to build a strategy, to have a, take and, uh, a stop and target system, to have a risk management system, to have that all rolled in together, co you know, compiled with a uh, uh, a management system of markets that you're going to trade. Okay, so this is a plan. This is a trading plan. This is what we specialize in teaching individuals. So you have a trading plan. You uh, and and then you have a routine, like our daily scan routine that we teach people to do, right? Which is how they where, the, where they sit down, they analyze the markets, they take their trades, they they plan them out, they look to see if there's any, um, they look to see if everything checks the boxes for allowing them to trade or doesn't allow them to trade, and then they proceed with the trade and they place the trade, and then we walk away from the computer and we go ship post and members launch. This is what we do, right? Not 15 minute scalps, not uh not 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 30 minute scalps, not not five second scalps, not the latest trade setup that you saw on, you know, and listen, no, no disrespect to Crown, but on, on Crown Script, okay. Uh good guy actually. Uh, you know, and 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 focus on you and your trade plan and your PL, because at the end of the day, you're 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 responsible for your bills, your PL, your profit, your family, your house, your mortgage, all of that. It's you. And crypt and and the dude that posted that trade setup on crypto Twitter uh, is not going to pay your bills. So listen, I know a lot of people struggle with this, particularly in these market situations. So again, um, we are trend following traders. So typically, what we need to do is no, not I would not say when to exercise discretion. What we really should focus on is strategy building, right? So if you've been getting a ton of signals, if you've been getting chopped up in this latest market range, I'm just I'm, I'll tell you what the issue is. You have the wrong indicators. Okay, you have the wrong indicators. They're too sensitive. I would uh, generally assume that it's going to be your vol filter, right? 
So, for example, uh, we've talked about Wadatar Explosion is a very popular confirmer and vol filter that individuals use. It is a public indicator. You guys can go check Wadatar Explosion out or at least our implementation of it out. Uh, the reason why I added the false positive filter is because I find that that actually really helps smooth the trades out. Okay. Uh, the original version is really good, but I find that the false positive filter is very, very helpful. That's why that's what I use now. So, uh, but it's it, it, uh, on by if you use the original settings for Watertar Explosion, it's pretty sensitive, right? It's it's pretty sensitive. So you need to pair that with the correct, like insensitive confirmer or initiator, right? I'm a pretty strong advocate of having a sensitive initiator. I'm a pretty strong advocate of having an insensitive confirmer. Uh, I really like centered oscillator confirmers, um, although really enjoying the true strength index and modifications of it lately. So that's what went into my latest Donchian system that we've been utilizing for uh, uh, Forex, CFDs, and, and uh, ETFs. But, yeah. yeah, I think I made my point. All right, good stuff. All right, so, um, five-second scalp, go! <laughs> um... And, you know, what's what's really interesting is that as we progress, so if this becomes a breaking Bitcoin bits, that was just a big cut right there. But what's really interesting is that as we progress, I see a question here in the chart from uh, June 12th about um, have we not developed a low volatility season stra seasonal strategy? And, and and the reality is we don't have one that's automated and, and done and in, like in production mode, ready for production. We have a lot of uh, working betas, right? Because this is something that we would like to offer, right? We understand that there certainly is an edge in low volatility. Well, let me let me rephrase that. I, when when people say low volatility, I tend to disagree. I tend to say low momentum but high volatility. So um, so momentum is changing very rapidly, but um, but actual momentum threshold is not increasing. Generally, momentum or how quickly a market is moving generally explodes in a strongly trending environment. And when you're range bound, you do have high volatility. Most people say this is low volatility. It's really high volatility, right? If you're chopping around very much, that's high volatility. Things are changing very quickly, but your momentum is overall low, right? So it, the difference between um, uh, acceleration and velocity, right? So let's say that, right? So you have the, the rate of change and then the rate of the rate of change. So um, there certainly are edges to trading those strategies. This is, for example, like what one of my um, automated strategies that I'm working on right now called ISIS bot focuses on uh, is is trading those those ranges trading those those peaks highs and lows and we've we're, we're, I'm working on complementing that with uh, horizontal support and resistance which I think is is a is a good range bound strategy um, and then we also now have in the works um, a new indicator that can determine objectively whether a market is range bound or trending. And what's really cool about it is kind of that shift in between, right? Where you can kind of catch that sweet zone where you get that alert to, hey, all right, turn off strategy A, turn on strategy B. All things that are going to be uh, tested and rolled out and debuted in our automated trading platform. So, um, uh, so let's... Um, but yeah, I would say right now, uh, the way that I've always dealt with that over the years is that instead of, for me anyways, for instead of trying to, instead of trying to optimize a range bound strategy, which just now years in, into trading, I'm working on now, uh, I just go trade different markets, right? So for example, when I look at crypto, I'm like, hmm, okay, Bitcoin ain't trending right now. Altcoins are popping. So I've been trading a lot of altcoins um, and Forex and ETFs and uh, but for example, like there were two weeks there where ETFs weren't really trending. So I'm like, hmm, I'm going to go trade altcoins more. And so I, I just move, I just move around in different markets, right? I'll go trade some uh, indice CFDs. Generally, I prefer trading commodity CFDs, but um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's been my approach to, to low volatility seasonality, right? I'll just, I'll switch to a different market because um, for, you know, there are some markets that that move and then consolidate and then move and then consolidate and everything's seasonal, everything changes. You know, everything is slightly fractal, but not really. Um, yeah, so diversification in marketplaces, and I've really enjoyed that. I've really enjoyed that because that limits my risk exposure to one particular asset class or sector or market and really allows me to just kind of broaden out. And that's really psychologically empowering when a lot of individuals that I talk to like just want to trade Bitcoin and I'm like, listen, there's nothing wrong with that. But you are now, 
like tying your profitability and 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 your well-being to timing the movements of one market in one asset class where you could be diversified and take advantage of a, a lot of of different aspects and not be so hyper optimized on bitcoin right like i've been there i've seen it you know you're sitting there like yelling at your monitor with, you know wanting bitcoin to do something like reading furiously every bitcoin thing getting into the bitcoin memes the moon the the, the moon and doom stuff and um you know th there's there's no reason for that right like bitcoin will eventually make a movement and that's the time to take a trade um not when you know things are, are getting chopped around uh, there are other markets that aren't getting chopped around and i, I think that's pretty cool you know, I've, I've always been, I've always enjoyed, you know, for example, right? I, I really enjoyed this when I first got into Forex or when I got into crypto, excuse me, when I got into crypto and most of my colleagues were still in Forex, you know, coming into like, you know, say we're, say we're going to go have some drinks and people are talking about like their latest Forex trades and now the Forex market's dead. Like it, for example, 2018 was very much like this, right? 2018 was dead. And, um, and, and I'd say the first half of 2019, honestly, it wasn't until like the latter half of 2019 that the volatility came back in. And, you know, they would complain that, man, you know, the Forex markets are dead and they're not making any money and they're not meeting their quotas. And, you know, I'm over there. I'm like, well, you know, yeah, it's kind of dead over here. But like, look, look at this. Look at the Bitcoin trades that I just made. And look at these, you know, Monero trades that I just made. And oh, by the way, I'm also trading these ETFs over here. And it's just pretty cool. You know, it, it's 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 pretty cool to be diversified. So, all right, let's move on. Sorry, we were on that for a long time. Maybe that would make a good breaking Bitcoin bits. OK, so I just kind of. uh uh, just kind of tweaked up this chart right here. This is going to be the daily. Uh, this is the chart that we normally look at. Um, uh, this is the um, this is the chart that we normally look at after we look at my the indicators that I utilize and kind of my methodology. This is just RSI and Bollinger Bands, just very simple classical technical analysis with some trend lines and some support and resistance. So uh, let's just look at critical levels <coughs> that we currently have right now. Uh, we are still consolidating underneath the long-term horizontal line that stretches from the peak of Bitcoin's high in 2017, marked the high in 2019, uh, and has so far marked the, I'd say, the double top so far that we've had in 2020, maybe even triple top, although this did occur in October 2019. Um, I don't really see anything on the downside. Obviously, I've seen like lots and lots and lots of charts, and people have like some kind of trend line projecting out from down here. I don't I don't see that whatsoever. I don't think Bitcoin is respecting any form of uh, lower boundary, except maybe like the power law corridor. Um, and then, you know, some people might get out there and say, like the stock to flow model ratio or something like that. So um, that's uh, that's a little bit uh, beyond the TA of what I'm comfortable with and talking about. So I think that things are a little bit more simpler than that. Uh, so we have current like when this is more macro stuff, this is macro time frame stuff. This is weekly and, and kind of three day and daily chart stuff which is what we focus on. Um, so we still have horizontal resistance in the form of the triple top. And I would say the um, uh, the high volume node from the consolidation area that occurred over here at the peak of 2019 when we had this distribution zone, you know, just cutting a line right through the middle of it marks kind of the local resistance area pretty well. So this is where a lot of individuals, this is where the most volume is concentrated by price uh, as far as selling, right? So remember that in any area that marks the top, the majority of, of volume is not going to be at the peaks, right? The majority of volume is not going to be on the highs. Like, so for if we go back to 2019, right? Uh, although price did make this massive movement, um, the, the majority of individuals that sold Bitcoin, like not a lot, like qual quantitatively of Bitcoin was sold at these levels, right? Not a lot quantitatively was sold at these levels. Most individuals did not sell actually above 10,000. So the you know this this idea that people seem to have that uh that um you know like you know it was a small minority that hodled and were bag holders uh you know as bitcoin dropped from 19,000 to 3,000 and that you know everybody else you know all the early influencers like got out and made riches like that's not true right i would argue that the majority of individuals that were early early adopters and got into bitcoin sub $100 let's say sub $100 probably have a mean exit of around six grand if they're lucky if they're lucky which is still ridiculous of course but uh and i would argue and maybe even lower maybe even closer to like 2000 and individuals that got in like let's say sub 1000 which you had any opportunity to do prior to 2017 
uh, probably also have an, uh, an average exit of around 6,000, right? Remember that the, the cost basis for Bitcoin so far is $6,000. So this narrative that so many individuals like sold the top is, is incorrect. It's incorrect. It's, it, it is factually incorrect. Um, Let's see here. That looks like a really cool smiley face, doesn't it? Like a like maybe a like a like a Leela smiley face. All right, anyways. Um <laughs> Get him, Alex. Uh so let's get rid of that here for a second. All right. So Current overhead resistance in the form of, let's say, this triple top and the previous distribution area around 10,350, long-term resistance area of about 12,000, right? Breaking above 12,000, I've been very consistent about that. Breaking above 12,000 is that momentum breakout, in my opinion, signal. Uh, certainly a weekly close above 12,000 at this point in time would be a very, very strong bullish impetus. And I would honestly be looking for something like uh, 21,000. Uh, eventually, if we were to break those levels, but we still have 10,000 or 10,350 to be a little bit more precise above us and current support at around 8,627. I do really, I really do feel that uh, 8,627 is certainly more likely at this point in time. Um, yeah. And I do not have my uh, I do not have my swing short open yet at this point in time. Uh, I've been consistent upon this as well. I told you guys I would let you know uh, when I did anything. I still haven't. Let's go back over to, to Bitcoin over here and turn Quadrigo off. Yeah. Uh, and dynamic money flow still creeping into the negative, but not getting there yet. Remember, dynamic money flow is smooth to the degree that, for example, like here's uh, the previous drop from Bitcoin's peak in February of 2020. And DMF does not begin to signal short until after about, let's say, an initial 20% drop. Uh, and then it catches uh, a further, uh, well, let's just say 60 to 80% drop, depending on depending on where you actually would have got into that, uh, that area. Uh, but nicely to the upside, because Bitcoin is typically a long-only asset. It's only been a few times in history where, um, you know, buying at any price level and then holding for a year has not rewarded you very, very rarely. Uh, because Bitcoin, like stonks, pretty much just goes up, right? You know, like I, I know that I know that people tend to not have that perception on the retail side, and that's because people on the retail side typically are not patient. But historically, Bitcoin is an asset that goes up. So let's. Yeah, so I certainly do feel like 8627 is the more likely scenario right here. Uh, which would also be very, very close. We'll bring up the volume profile chart again here. Uh, as you can see, we're stuck right in the middle of that kind of bigger high volume node right here with direct overhead resistance at 10,200. And again, 8147 demarcating support down there at the bottom. Now, that 8147, or let's just call it 8150 to 8200, is certainly about $400 below uh, 8600, which is where I, which is what I marked out on the other chart, but still very, very similar, very, very close. So again, uh, this makes sense. We're in a high volume node. High volume nodes are train stations, not train tracks. When price is in train stations, or let's call price a train here. When price is in the train station, price hangs out in the train station, goes and sees the gift shop, takes photos, does the tourist, does the tourist stuff, you know, buys gift cards, all that stuff, uh, you know, gets lattes. Uh, when price exits high volume nodes, it tends to move very rapidly until the next fair market value area. This is auction market theory of, of markets, which is in my which in my estimation and in my education is correct. This is the correct way to look at the markets is auction market theory. Um, so breaking, uh, you know, breaking 8600 uh, to me, I think, and I'm talking weekly close below 8600. Most likely we see $6,000 Bitcoin again. Um, yeah, so things certainly are... Um, I am certainly becoming more bearish as I look at this. I haven't taken a play out of this yet. Uh, I, I don't have long exposure to Bitcoin right now at this point in time, except for my long-term portfolio, which I will always have long exposure to Bitcoin on that. But as far as my trading account, I do not have long exposure. I, I moved into Tether before I went on vacation and I have not undone that. I have taken a few trades uh, since I've been back. I haven't actually posted those as premium signals because they were automated. So for example, I saw that, my lo that, that, that the system that I do currently have open uh, did take a short last night on Bitcoin. 
Uh, it was uh, it caught about a 1% movement. It was about a two Bitcoin trade. So nothing serious right there. Um, and uh, uh, and it and it did actually just open up a long, which I don't really have any opinion on that. It just runs automatically the way that it's supposed to. Uh, but I don't have any uh, I don't have any directional bias at this point in time. It is it, well, that is un, that is untrue. I do have directional bias to the downside. I do not think that this uh, this level will hold in the short term. It does. I do feel like price will likely move up. Uh, simply because uh, we have been uh, attempting to sell the bottom this entire time, and we have this massive spike in backwardation, which indicates that retail is piling into the short side. So what's probably going to happen? Price is likely going to go up uh, until we get something like this, uh, where we do actually see uh, funding go positive for a while and big dump. So this is the uh, this is the five minute chart of Bitcoin. Uh, the XBT USD contract on BitMEX, of course, and we just see what what just happened. Uh, you know, individuals attempting to short and predicted funding just went short. Predicted funding just went short. That's how hard individuals are attempting to short, and this is typically indicative of retail traders. So I would say not a great move for the bears right this second. Right this second. I do think that again, given enough patience and time on the daily swing side, I think that 8600 is far more likely at this point in time. Then we'll kind of have to reevaluate there and see are we going to break this level and are we going to descend down to 6000? Okay, cool. Then we'll reevaluate there or are we going to continue to consolidate and range? You know, options expired this morning. And the reality is this uh the reality is this we, we kind of saw the movement like the expiration, we saw the down movement. But what would be the, um, you know, uh, I can't, I, I can't remember uh, who I was talking to earlier, but, um, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest, uh, the biggest strike prices. And we went off this, um, we went over this yesterday when we went over skew, so let's go to skew. Uh, shoot. There we go, skew.co. Okay, they, so it's just skew.com now, sorry. Uh, Bitcoin options. And we were looking at, I think it's on page three. Yeah, open interest by strike price. And uh, 10,100. Uh, 11,100 are the, uh, the biggest strike price numbers and then down to the downside. Well, I would certainly say that 12,000 and 13.5, 14.5, like I said, somebody bought a $75,000 call. It looks like. So, uh, I mean, very, very small premium. I'm sure on that, but still it's just, I guess you can just go over there to Darabit and write whatever you like over there. Maybe, I don't know. Um, and what do we got coming in here? Oh, interest i wanted to look at oh so let's stay on this so 10,100 and 9,000 and we're we're right here so with a big spike in i'm going to probably say $9,000 puts and probably a big spike at $10,100 $100 calls um the 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 area of max pain would be as alex has been saying uh, quite consistently would be for price to just continue to go sideways you know, people, you know, I, I talked about this yesterday, right? I talked about, you know, options yesterday. That was our biggest story and, and a good breaking Bitcoin bits last night. Over a thousand people watched that. Thank you guys. I appreciate that. Um, You know, where I was, I was pretty cavalier about the options thing, right? You know, like I believe I started off that story with like, it's the biggest amount of open interest that we've seen since the last time we had the biggest amount of open interest we've ever seen. Oh my God. You know, I pay attention to SKU data and options data, and when I see something that's that's important, I will I will mention it, or maybe take a trade based off of it. Um, but generally, because I'm not a big options contract player, that but um, that's actually something that we're looking on adding. Uh, that might be one of the courses that we add actually here relatively soon, uh, because we do have uh, a few people on the team who are who are who are quite good at options trading, and we're going to be uh, working together to design. Uh, some some Bitcoin specific option strategies. So, lost my train of thought. Um, so, um, yeah, that'll be interesting because I know options are very popular, particularly among American traders. So that'll just you know give us more value to offer. Um. 
Yeah, so so obviously the resolution of maximum pain. Uh obviously the 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 uh the 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 outcome of maximum pain would be for price to continue to go sideways, which it most likely will continue to do. Um Pi, send me a DM and uh, I will do my best to set you up, my friend. Okay, so I wanted to go over this too because this was uh this was a big want to do um earlier. You know, uh I saw that uh, a few people made videos about this. This this Bitcoin miners to exchanges. Uh, we covered this yesterday. Like a huge surge of um, uh, Bitcoin was sent to Bitfinex from miners for the first time, and we can actually look at the stacked uh, glass node on this, and we can actually see what pool it came from. And let's just get right on in there. There we go. So. Um, yeah, so this was not from a massive pool. This was from another uh, other miner. No, that was not as helpful as, as, as I was hoping it to be. Uh, Jake, okay, let me answer your question. Is is what I have an API set up with three commas? I I do have some three commas bots that are working, and then we also, um, I'd say the thing that I'm playing with the most is what we have built in house, which is what we want to roll out here progressively. So, kind of order of operations for prioritization here of what we're working on as a company is currently right now. Um, main focus of me anyways, is the online trading Academy. Uh, once that's nice and rolled out here in July, then we'll, we'll kind of double back and finish a lot of the automation work that we had gotten done, as well as a pretty big, massive publishing of new indicators, updates to indicators, strategy testers, uh, and things of the like. So then following that, uh, we see some rollout or early phase beta of our automated systems. And then, uh, kind of moving later into the year, we see, uh, let's say the, um, the front end of that end up going up. So, but there's nothing wrong with three commas. You just, you know, you certainly have a lot more options than nothing, but if you really want to build like a good bot, in my opinion, you're, you're going to need to write some code. You got to write some code. So, uh, getting back to my point I wanted to make. So that was just kind of off the cuff, but, um, so we see, Let's stretch this back and go back to like the beginning of 2018. And we, we see this. Uh, we see these big spikes in um, minor uh, flow to exchanges. So this is miners sending Bitcoin to exchanges. And I didn't really see anybody look at this with any analysis. Like all the headlines, all the charts, everybody that I talked to, everything that I saw on Twitter, Reddit, Discord was just miners sending Bitcoin to exchanges, market must crash. And I don't like taking things that are assumed axiomatically. So uh, I, I studied this chart for about 30 minutes this morning. And the reality is that I do not see any correlation whatsoever except for volatility, right? Um, so typically when we see these large spikes, for example, uh, let me see if I can, um, yeah, you, I know you guys can see my mouse here. So let me see if, uh, let me see if this is gonna work. Oh, did not wanna do it. There we go. Ah, come on. Uh, 
Ah, uh, you little bugger. Well, that's disappointing. Oh, it's working in like every other terminal except this one. Great. I'm glad you think so, Alex. <sighs> you know, I'm not going to say that you... I'm not saying that you're saying that I'm not saying that you can't do that. I think I got that right. What I am saying is that in my experience, you will most likely not have the odds stacked in your favor in the long run moving forward with that concept. Yeah, man. Just outperform the HTFs, no problem, dude. Uh, so, anyways, let's go back to talking about this. I'd wanted to put up, uh, pull up my uh, my highlighter, but it uh, it does not seem to want to work, unfortunately. And maybe if I do this, it'll work. There we go. Aha! Let's get a red color going on here. All right, so uh, let's look at this spike right here. Okay. This spike, we see this massive spike in coming out of kind of the, the uh, or during the run up in 2017. And what happens? Price moves up. Okay. Uh, let's ignore these small spikes. Let's look at this one right here. What this baby spike happens at the very bottom of the market in 2018. And what happens? Price moves up. Okay. Uh, here we see a big flow spike right here. And we probably should, excuse me, we probably should try to zoom in on that. Um... Let's see here. It does. I guess let's. Uh, Yeah, that does happen at a high, and then we see a second drop down. Okay, so there's one where we do see the market move down. This one, these two, market seems to move down, but not, I wouldn't say dramatically. This, this movement here is pretty dramatic, but market moves down here. Uh, this one is a pretty slow slide off, market moves down. Here's a pretty good size spike, market moves up. Here's a pretty good size spike, market moves up. Here's a pretty good size spike, market moves down, and here's a pretty good size spike, question mark, right? So I would say that certainly we can say that, um, that perhaps looking at this, uh, market cycle matters or phase of the market matters. Like for example, like, well, if we've been bottomed out, whatever that means, and we see a big influx of Bitcoin, it's miners, um, you know, and th the other thing is this, right? I don't like that axiomatic assumption that if Bitcoin by miners is, is if a large chunk of Bitcoin is deposited to exchanges by miners, that it's going there to be sold. There are numerous reasons why Bitcoin would be deposited on why large quantities of Bitcoin could be deposited to exchanges by miners. So, for example, we have to take into account we know that volumes on exchanges are at record year lows, record year lows. Individuals have been exodusing their uh, Bitcoin deposits on exchanges into cold storage or off of exchanges in general, right? So this means that volatility has been quite high, momentum has been quite low, and this contributes to the overall phase of the market and kind of this choppy behavior. Why? Because when volume is low, it is far easier for bots or algorithms to manipulate the market or play uh, just predictable trade setup patterns, right? Just predictable trade setup patterns and really push the market around. It also makes uh, it's easier for whales or dolphins or sharks or whatever you want to call them uh, to move the market around as well. It makes liquidity plays very popular uh, and it makes kind of this ultra discretionary and it makes retail traders, unfortunately, kind of rush into this ultra discretionary, like, let's say, liquidity pool trading strategy, which is not going to work for them when the volume comes back into the market and we actually begin trending, which is typically where a buy and hold swing trading strategy is the most successful. But because they get they they get all kind of optimized to this um, particular strategy because volume is low. When volume comes in, they forget, right? 
So this is this goes back to that original concept what I was talking about the lack of or the 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 evaporation of patients leading to you being trapped in a non-patient trading strategy which is not going to work long term for your success. So we could say that or excuse me so so just because uh, so so who has lots of bitcoin miners have lots of bitcoin who has let's say who can have collaborative agreements in the space? Well, certainly people who have lots of Bitcoin and exchanges. We call that providing liquidity. Typically, exchanges give you an incentive to do that. So this was sent to Bitfinex. Um, Bitfinex is probably one of the more popular exchanges for larger players in the space. I certainly know that regardless, uh, even though uh, despite all of the kind of uh, FUD about uh, 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 Bitfinex and Tether and of course and all that, they are still pretty popular among uh, larger traders and uh uh, and miners. So they could be providing liquidity. They could be opening up leverage longs to hedge exposure, for example. Um, they could be, I mean, they could literally be doing anything. Uh, most likely, I think what they're likely doing is providing liquidity. Right? They're providing liquidity. And we don't know, um, for example, what, like I said, what relationship Bitfinex may have, which is where this big deposit went yesterday with the miner in question. Uh, could mean nothing. Probably means absolutely nothing. Um, or we could say that, well, maybe this is some correlation with price movement because now that there's more, again, remember what I said? I don't see a correlation in directional movement. I see a correlation with volatility, right? Or more specifically, momentum, meaning like price is now going to begin moving very rapidly, generally in a, in a straight line somewhere. So we're going to have some directional bias. So this would impart that it is likely that we can see some breakout of this consolidation area because there has been an injection of volume into a large market so now we can actually get position traders and get a large momentum move in one direction does not instill any directional bias so i just wanted to cover this topic because this was like so hyped in the media crypto media for the last day or so and because it just happened yesterday uh, and I didn't really see any kind of critical analysis of it. So I don't think it is in any way, shape, or form as clear-cut as individuals have made it out to be. Well, great. I'm going to get rid of this thing now. Um, there we go. So there is that. Uh, we covered Bitcoin, price likely to move up intraday. But on the macro, I think we're still looking bearish. Ethereum, I believe, is still looking bearish intraday. Um, movement down to 8,600 is a little bit more likely at this point in time, in my opinion, which would pretty much, which actually, you know, what's funny is I, I was I, I was assuming a resolution of this entire formation of this entire area. No, just a retest of support. <laughs> so maybe we'll see. Maybe, maybe we'll see that uh, actual uh, actual range breakout here. So let's get into, uh, boy, it is almost one o'clock. So I want to bring the guys on. So let's kind of start breaking down today's news. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about. If you guys have questions, drop them in the chat. Uh, give me a few moments. We're going to take a brief break uh, just for a minute or so and just get prepared. Uh, let's go check out with, um, actually, this is a good idea. Uh, back by popular demand. Uh, it is, you know, obviously, let's say humid out there in the Bitcoin weather right in the bitcoin ecosystem so let's check in with bitcoin weatherman and junior analyst midwest attempts to see what the forecast is for today jason what do you got for us today Dump it all. Just get rid of it. It's going to zero. <laughs> Back to you. Back to you.
More trouble over at Wirecard Solutions, of course, the issuer of the very popular Crypto.com Visa debit card. And they have now been, let's say, shut down after the UK's main financial watchdog, that's the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, announced it has suspended the payment processor and its cards from operating. And that means that UK and Eurozone users of the Crypto.com product have now been left out in the cold. Now, the German payment processing firm Wirecard has had a spectacular fallout from Grace, and it sent shockwaves across Europe when it outright collapsed yesterday, leaving creditors holding a 4 billion, yes, that is Billy with a B, billion dollar bag after it was disclosed that a $2 billion deficit was found on its books, which one audit firm described as a result of a sophisticated form of global fraud. Now, trouble appeared Trouble appeared on the horizon just last week when it was revealed that the German-based online payment processor was unable to locate, just lost it, just a little bit over $2.1 billion worth of company funds. Yeah, Bob, I'm sorry. The martinis were very expensive for the business lunches, just super expensive. Now, the situation quickly deteriorated when the company's stock price began plunging on the German stock market. Almost looks like the chart of XRP. Followed by the CEO quitting, uh, short selling, and later trading altogether getting halted. And finally, Wirecard filing for insolvency yesterday. Now, the magnitude of this failure begins to dawn on people when they consider the fact that the European Commission has launched a formal investigation into Germany's financial watchdog to determine how this oversight managed to happen, with some even suggesting that the German regulators may have been complicit to a degree with this fraud. Germany's Financial Times has been reporting on potential fraud going on at Wirecard, but Germany's watchdogs seem to have been far more interested in objecting to their reporting than it did into digging into what was actually going on at Wirecard. Now, the effects of this demise are being felt throughout the crypto space, as the FCA has set numerous conditions and prohibitions on Wirecard solutions today, such as being no longer able to conduct any regulated activities or uh, and in order to freeze all assets and funds of their users. Now, the folks over at Crypto.com and the MCO card assured their Euro and UK customers that funds are SAFU and that users will see their outstanding funds flow back into the Crypto.com balances within 48 hours. Now, the British regulator did go on to add that they will be working closely with Wirecard UK, that is the subsidiary of Wirecard Solutions, uh, in the UK to in order to help sort out this corporate mishap and will take all necessary actions to safeguard the interests of the public, stating that they took additional measures to ensure Wirecard ceased all operations, meaning that Wirecard could not access customers' money to basically claw it back in attempt to fill this big vacant hole. 
therefore protecting customer funds to a degree. So for those unfamiliar with Wirecard Solutions, they were the issuer of the Visa debit cards for crypto to fiat platforms like Crypto.com and 10X. And an official statement was published by the Crypto.com CEO on their blog today explaining how the unfortunate collapse of Wirecard should not have an irreparable impact on customer demand for crypto debit cards. And Crypto.com stated that they're now working on transferring the card program to a new vendor and payment provider. And once that is in place, it would allow the firm to resume issuing cards and operating again in the Eurozone and the UK, allowing their customers to begin enjoying their crypto visa cards at point of sale terminals again. But for right now, eh, we're on hold. And as for crypto.com and MCO users in other regions, U.S. customers are apparently not affected by the Wirecard scandal because U.S. Crypto.com customers have their cards issued by Metro Bank and are therefore unaffected, it seems. However, for users in the Asia Pacific, the, the Asia Pacific region, their card issuer was also a subsidiary of Wirecard Solutions. So while it remains functional as of now, Crypto.com users from Asia, including Australia and New Zealand, should be wary that their cards will be the next to be suspended. And that's really a shame because Crypto.com's fortunes were looking better than ever in recent weeks. It has it had rolled out in several regions and the Crypto.com app went live across several platforms, the Apple Store, Android's Google Play, and even Samsung. So uh, live on Samsung Pay. So we were even discussing Crypto.com on the show just a few weeks ago with at least one of our members looking to join the platform, but waiting for a good opportunity to purchase the necessary MCO tokens at an attractive price. Now it seems the disaster at Wirecard might have provided you know, a good entry opportunity to acquire said MCO tokens at a nice discount, seeing that the token is down over 30% from recent highs. And while this may be, right, it all depends on the response. While this may be the beginning of the end, for MCO.com. This, they might have to rethink, and maybe I don't want to say the beginning of the end. I think the MCO will recover from this. Uh, but this might be the beginning of a, of a more pronounced downturn for the card, right? Particularly if any issues are found in the United States region or if the role, uh, if the suspensions roll over to the Asia Pacific region, as I think that they likely will. And uh, if MCO has issues, if crypto.com has issues with finding another reliable and convenient uh, card issuer and payment provider. However, However, it could also be an opportunity. You know, Alex pointed this out this morning where, uh, you know, think of all these potential competitors like PayPal, Square Cash, Venmo, for example, um, you know, Varo, uh, all these potential all these potential partners or issuers or any other kind of financial companies that were looking at something like Crypto.com as competition because they, well, they already got their provider, their competition to us now because their provider is competition to us. Now it's an opportunity because you know that so many of these financial companies are looking for their in into crypto and now that and now that crypto.com finds itself in need of a new card issuer and payment provider potentially this could actually be quite good so again down about 30 percent potential buying opportunity you know again as with all uh, as with all things you guys are responsible for your own decisions do your own due diligence and make your investment choices wisely so uh what do you guys think you know are any of you obviously we have a big uk based audience uh are any of you guys crypto.com customers and are you worried about your funds and if service will be restored and are any of you prospective customers that were waiting for a good opportunity to buy into mco and do you think this is now it or do you think that you want to be more patient and wait to see how this thing whole uh, plays out or you know has this whole fiasco turned you off from crypto.com and has you worried about the future of these crypto to fiat debit cards however you feel make sure to let us know in the comments section down below. We'll touch on this here in a little bit when we bring the guys on. Before we do that, let's move on to our second story real quick and break down on this. All right, so this is from uh, Crypto Briefing. Ethereum miners spam the blockchain with small transactions. Ethereum is experiencing high transaction volumes due to excessive mining pool activity. And I noticed last this last night because I was playing around with a few DeFi protocols as well as my pooled liquidity on Uniswap. I was looking to actually finally migrate my liquidity from V1 to V2 uh, with their automated tool. Uh, and uh, that did not play out so well because the blockchain is full. So something we touched on just the other day in our Ethereum and DeFi story is the runaway growth and success of the DeFi ecosystem on Ethereum. And this was reflected in not only the total value uh, locked up in DeFi, but also in daily transaction metrics on the Ethereum network being at all-time highs. 
But now it seems some of the exploding transaction numbers on Ethereum can be explained not only by DeFi's popularity, but also spam transactions getting generated by various mining pools on the network. Data from Etherscan reveals that Ethereum's mining pools are engaging in spamming the network with many small transactions, which has contributed to the over 1 million transactions currently being logged each day, a high point that we haven't seen since early 2018. And apparently the explanation that is most logical that is behind this behavior by mining pools is that they are doing so in order to harvest mining rewards from the same transactions that they send. Several pools are partially responsible for those transactions with Ethermine, making up more than 13,000 transactions over the last 24 hours. Nanopool and Sparkpool behaving quite similarly. And the transaction, the average transaction fees, which were about 66 cents last night, uh, are about 75 cents as of this morning and kind of stretching from June 24th. So th the question would be like, why would these in why would these entities engage in such wash transactions? And according to speculation from trust nodes, these miners or pools are sending these transactions in order to obtain the rewards that come from mining them. And this is evident in the fact that many of these transactions are as small as not point not not one Ethereum or about 25 cents, which suggests that the real value being transferred is actually contained in the transaction fee, not in the amount being sent. And further speculation would suggest that low payout thresholds for miners inside these pools is likely responsible for this continued behavior. In other words, mining pools are paying smaller miners their appropriate rewards for legitimate reasons, but choosing to do it through the transaction fees. Still, trust nodes ultimately maintain that today's transaction volume is excessive by any measure, equal to two months of the network running at full capacity. Ethereum congestion was previously an issue for a different reason, high volume smart contracts. Since March, Ethereum's capacity has been burdened by big projects like Tether and scams like the PLUS token and the MMM token. Also, there was the KICK token, which we warned everybody about. Incidentally, some of today's mining related spam has caused those contracts to cut back on their previously scheduled activity. Cointelegraph reported that PLUS token has been unable to move its funds due to today's volume. So, yay, we, 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 we stalled off the dump until Monday. Congestion has also been an issue in past years as well. Crypto kitties clogged the Ethereum blockchain in 2017, while the iFish token overburdened the network in 2018. Various proposals that could solve Ethereum's congestion problems are, of course, underway, including gas fee tweaks, you know, EIP-1559, meta transactions, staking and sharding, just to name a few. However, it still remains an issue today. So, guys, if you are out there wanting to do some smart contract tomfoolery, maybe just wait a week or so because uh, it is not it's not going to it's not going to be moving today quickly. Um, if you guys have questions about that, let me know in the comment section down below. Do you think that Trust Nodes has this wrong? Is this not what's going on? Is there another reason for this? Uh, and you know, overall, you know, are you guys going to take the uh, the pitchforks and torches to these mining pools, or hey, it just is what it is, Joe? So let us know in the comment section down below. With that being said, guys, we have been on for quite a while. It is a Friday show, so let's keep the fun rolling, guys. If you have questions, drop them in the live chat. We'd be happy to answer them. We will be taking some chart requests, but let me get the guys on and see. Uh, and see what, what what kind of scuttlebutt we can kick up. Give me just a, give me just a second. Can't catch a break over on BitMEX with all the wicks? Try a better alternative at bybit.crackingcryptocurrency.com and rest easy for a change. All right, and we are back, and I am joined as uh, as per usual. Let me actually get these on chat, get some music going on. I'm joined as usual by Mr. Crypto Jack and Senior Analyst Alexander. How are you guys doing today? Good, good, you. Yeah. I'm well. How y'all doing, ladies and germs? Right. And we know what Alex thinks of all of you. Be sure to let him know what you think of him. Hmm. All right, hold on. Let me just uh, get this set up like this. And 
boom, we are we're in action. Okay, things are looking fine and dandy. I think I need to adjust the focus of my uh, camera a little bit. Bring it, bring it in a little bit. I think my, my hand is in focus more than my face. Moving right along. Let's see here. Let's uh, scroll back here through some of these comments. What do you guys think about uh, this wire card thing? Uh, I, like I said, I think ultimately it exists mostly as a buying opportunity for MCO. I mean, if if people were being incredibly logical about this, like, okay, yes, this is very bad what has happened to Wirecard, but except for the fact that the customers are inconvenienced, they're, as Wirecard said, they're, the customer's money is being kept in a, in a separate bank somewhere else. Like, it's all, it's not like a fractal reserve system or something like that. So everybody's money is safe. The only thing that happened is like the actual physical cards aren't working because like that payment processor just kind of no longer exists. But, you know, it's people are sort of taking that panic about the situation and selling into it. So, um, you know, as we all know, alt season has been kind of, you know, silently raging around Bitcoin for the past uh, month and a half. But during that time, MCO has just been, um, can you, can you pull that up on, uh, pull up MCO actually? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I have it pulled up. Okay. So, you know, it's just been, yeah, Mark, uh, so from the beginning of May, it has just been, uh, you know, it's been on its way down and it's continued to go down, which has accelerated over the past uh, week and a half as the news has just gotten worse and worse. Um, but ultimately, this is not bad news for crypto.com. It's not going to send the company out of business. Their business model is not affected. The, the, the company itself is not affected. It's just, uh, you know, they got caught up in some drama. That's kind of, you know, makes them look bad by proxy. Yep, I agree. I don't think it is, uh, uh, I don't think it's necessarily a bad, um, uh, it doesn't, like you said, it's not, it's pretty clear that this doesn't affect customer funds. Uh, their cards are disabled. It's, you know, it's obviously bad publicity, uh, but it's really more bad publicity for, for obviously Wirecard. I would say, you know, obviously MCO is getting caught in the firestorm, but yeah, so. Um, you know what? I, I'll, I, that, that would make sense. But at the same time, I've seen so many like normie news articles almost bordering on fake news that are basically running with crypto.com in the title and i see a lot of people especially the normies their takeaway is oh two billion dollars was lost in the yet another crypto ponzi scheme right so uh, this is almost like you know the the MCO or the CRO blockchain wasn't compromised. Realistically, this is nothing really to do with crypto.com except for the issuer of the card. But this doesn't take away from the fact that, uh, you know, people have a perfect opportunity to, uh, to dunk on crypto yet again, right? Except, you know, for the people in the know, we were kind of laughing because um, as unfortunate as this circumstance is, uh, this really is a problem with traditional finance, right? This isn't something, this wasn't a big scam perpetrated on the blockchain that robbed people of their uh, of their crypto. This was uh, purely uh, a, you know, a fraud in the world of traditional finance. And I did a little digging into this uh, earlier today. Apparently uh, had to do with um, a, Philippi a bank in the Philippines. So they had some kind of... Uh, uh, another bank, some kind of shell bank, maybe in the Philippines, and that's where this black hole of billions of dollars was supposedly disappearing to. So, again, completely a matter of traditional finance fraud, um, and really nothing to do with crypto. But this doesn't take away from the opportunity to, uh, of course, smear crypto, uh, you know, uh, at this opportunity. So. I'm sure if you asked Wirecard, they would say the only thing they did wrong is get caught. Uh, so we just held out. So we just held out longer, like Deutsche Bank. We could have just paid like a ten million dollar fine, and then continued on with our lives, like nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. I think it speaks volumes, though, about um, 
you know, who, who Crypto.com had to get in bed with in order to get this card issued, right? So clearly, uh, you know, doing business, uh, you know, crossing over from the world of crypto to fiat is really difficult, right? Um, yeah. You know, clearly a lot of these traditional, uh, you know, payment processors and banks, uh, financial services, they don't want to do anything to do with crypto, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so clearly it's hard to find a vendor who's willing to issue you this type of card and give you this kind of gateway into the fiat world so you know um as easy it is for um the crypto.com ceo chris to be like oh you know we're just going to find another vendor and everything will be good again don't worry everybody's going to have their cards by november uh just in time for the uh, you know for christmas shopping season um maybe that's that's being a little hopeful maybe i mean maybe they had to scrape the bottom of the barrel just to get this payment processor secured, right? Yeah, that's uh, true. But they had to scrape the bottom of the barrel back in 2018, when that's like true. during the very beginning of the bear market, when everybody was like, "Oh, Bitcoin is going to zero. Like it was all a scam. It was all a big pawning screen. The bubbles finally popped. We're finally going to see it going to zero. You know, there was very little. Um, it was very little institutional or public confidence in Bitcoin, except for, you know, the the people who had become believers in 2017 and, you know, went on to become the veterans of the bear market. Um, you know, now that now that Crypto.com has kind of proven itself, I mean, Crypto.com wasn't even Crypto.com. They hadn't even bought the I don't even think they'd bought the URL yet when when they were making the deal with uh, they were still at monaco remember yeah they were i still, still i still think of them as monaco yeah so they were monaco at the time and, and they made this deal and then upon getting the deal they gained a great amount of legitimacy and on the back of that legitimacy they become this this large this large crypto company that they are now like you know they they have legitimacy up there with coinbase and a lot of the other ones like i definitely trust them i i would i have yeah. no problem sending our users over there if there's anything that needs to be purchased like yeah go to crypto.com you know they're not going to scam you um so i and justin mentioned that i had mentioned this earlier so i'm going to re-mention it uh, that um i yeah i i think that now that this company has proven themselves that like we are a multi-billion dollar company, then what what payment processor isn't going to want to go and fill YRX's shoes because there's so much money sitting on the table. And, and whereas before, you know, uh, you know, Cash App and uh, Cash App of Square and you know PayPal is doing their own crypto thing. There's all these other crypto payment processors that are like traditional finance is trying to step in to this sector. Uh, but, you know, if you're an executive of this company, you got to be asking yourself, hey, why don't we just go make a deal with these people who are kind of in desperate need of our services? We could probably get like a nice sweetheart deal with crypto.com right now if we, uh, you know, if we negotiate with them. And 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 we've got suddenly one of the most established names in crypto backing our services. You know, uh, it's. I think it would be it would be foolish to take advantage of that. I can see that uh, you know condition market conditions might be a little more favorable to them right now than they were in 2018. So I'll grant you that it may be, maybe it'll be easier to secure a replacement uh, sooner sooner than I thought, but um, still. Uh, doesn't uh, I think bode well in the uh, short to medium term? I am on the uh, Crypto.com uh, Discord server, and yeah. the amount of users flooding in there right now and crying and talking about uh, uh, dumping their MCO. Like uh, one of the discussions right now is that uh, a lot of the MCO is currently staked um, in order to secure the card, right? So people yeah. are saying there's actually a pretty small circulating supply, and I saw quite a few users saying that they cannot unstake fast enough in order to dump their mco they're thinking that this is doom and gloom so you know take that as you may maybe this is a, a perfect buy opportunity for that reason but uh maybe i mean it's only like at four dollars it's only down from five i was hoping for maybe a dip below four before i really bought in but uh yeah maybe not better not to be too greedy so maybe i ought to jump I, I'm, I'm with justin again. i like this entire consolidation area for buying um i just anywhere this area or under is a good buying opportunity yeah i mean this 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 is where we are currently at is literally the lows that mco put in for two years 
And then we had one dip below that, and this was in the market meltdown uh, that followed along with Bitcoin. And then it rallied yeah. with it, came back down uh, as Bitcoin sold off back into that area. And then the March meltdown. So like really all I see here is growth except for um, market-wide movements, right? You have the uh, the meltdown in late 2018, you have the ascension in 2019, you have the peak of the bull market in 2019, a sell-off back down to support, uh, peak, market meltdown in March, back up, and now you've just gotten basically a 40% drop right back into the middle of the consolidation area. So I would say that uh, MCO is not a steal here, but it is certainly a fair price based on the data that we have in front of us. Yeah, I've been waiting patiently for my buying opportunity. I think it's finally arrived. Although, to be honest, it was always kind of an impulse buy. I just wanted that shiny metal card. And now that there's potential that the card's not going to be delivered, suddenly my desire to pick up MCOs dwindled. It's metal, guys. The card is metal. So, yeah, so so about... So, you know, I'm I'm no mathematician, but... Last traded market price for MCO, and if we've got, we've got, you know, rums on the MCO Discord server dumping, right? Uh, let's see here. So, it'd be about $2,000, just off the top of my head, but you need 500 for the best card, is that right? 50,000 for the best card, so you're looking at 200 grand buy-in versus 200 grand 250 buy grand. Okay. 250 50, grand just the other day. Yeah, but it's 5% cash back on all purchases right? if you get that top tier one and it's gonna take yeah. a while to make back your 250 grand but uh no the basic card is i think like 50 mco so about 250 bucks when i was looking at it a mm -hmm. couple weeks ago but now with this decline drop to four bucks you know uh 200 to get into the basic card pretty tempting although uh i might just jump on there's that one that's i think uh 500 mco comes mm -hmm. out to about uh 2500 usd to get into the the cool purple or green card uh that one's got i think three percent cash back so maybe it's worth jumping up the tier but uh yeah you are looking at like a two thousand dollar outlay but uh i am tempted right now i'm not gonna lie yeah yeah uh brett over here uh b flow he uh he mentioned he bought some at eight eight dollars he's been staking since 2018 yeah, dude, you got nerves of steel holding through that bear market, but uh, you you look gold. I, I I don't see us getting much below the what the three dollar ish mark. I, I that would be insane to me if we got below that. Um, and it'd just be another buying opportunity, really. Yeah, so, and I, I think if if he picked up in 2018 as well and he's held a bag of that, I think he's earned some decent dividends from that. I think if you like stake and hold your MCO, you're getting like some divs every every year. So, uh, you know, he, he might have bought at the top or at eight bucks, but uh, he might've seen some decent dividends since then. So he might, might not be all bad. 6%, apparently 6% you get on the 500 or something like that, which I, I, I like. I think that's like, a stable not too inflationary staking amount you know when you hear people like oh they're getting like 25 percent per year on their staking it's like wow well you know i, I do not have high hopes for this coin <laughs> yeah. all right so, so the question is now justin are you going to be getting the card or not yeah actually i am so i uh you know full disclosure here right so i bought um it was uh i bought about 500 dollars worth of mco this morning at i think so price hasn't actually dropped that much so i think it was right around like four dollars and ten cents yeah it's right, right around here like just a little bit before the show you guys were there so about about like five hundred dollars worth at about four dollars and ten cents um if we drop under uh, and and so what i'll probably do is just continue to do that um i kind of plan on i don't really think i want to put 200 grand into you know i'd like to have uh, I think I'll start with, um, I think I'll probably pick up here around in the $4 range, probably about 500 MCO or about 2000 USD worth. And then I'll just kind of see where it goes. If the market continues to dip lower, then I'll most likely be patient and see if we can get around, you know, $3, maybe $3 and 25 cents and maybe buy at that point, maybe let's say a thousand to 2000. And then I'll probably see how that goes. I, I don't really feel that shiny black metal card is it is really really cool, um, but I, I just don't think you know that's you know two hundred thousand dollars is 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 still quite a quite a bit of money to me and sure money. 
I would, I would rather, I mean, I would rather, I would certainly rather put that somewhere else rather than into one asset in cryptocurrency. So I don't, I think that is a little bit out of my reach, uh, for it to make financial sense, but you know, you never know. You never know, but certainly going to pick up. What is it? The purple one? I think the purple one's the 500 or the red one. Yeah. I want to get that red. Uh, one. Yeah. The, the purple and green one are like the $2,000 level. And, uh, the, the red one is the basic like $250 level one. So I think I'm going to buy in for the $250 worth. And if it drops into the $3 range, maybe, uh, upgrade to the, uh, $2,500 level. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I did, I did want to, so I'm not really going crazy. I, you know, I don't have to have it. It's like I said, novelty more. So I, again, like crypto is something I prefer to hold, not necessarily spend on the fly out in the world. That's what Fiat's for. So I really don't see this card having actually a lot of use for me. Uh, so it's going to be difficult to justify even the, uh, the $2,500 purple card, let alone the $200,000 black card. I'm trying to think of the what name does? of that. It's called, uh, um uh what is that i think that's called the i can't think of what the name of it is um i think it's called like the the garts or the gants uh uh problem or or situation it's the it's the tendency of human beings to save what is rare and spend what is common right so so for example you know what i mean like what you just said there like dollars is what we spend out in the world because that's 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 common and crypto it's like uh eh, that's kind of rare i'm gonna hold on to that right and i certainly know that like so for example um when uh you know so i purchased a, a new truck recently right and i had to i had to to sell some assets to do that and i or i had to move i had to move funds around to have enough money to to purchase the truck and um you know, when I, when I, you know, kind of pulled my spreadsheet out in front of me and I was like, well, what, what originally came to my head is like, well, I'll just sell, you know, like $10,000 in stocks and, you know, move that money over here to my checking account and, and, you know, have, have that and then take some money from my savings and then purchase the truck. And then I thought about that for a second and I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hold on to what is rare. You know what I mean? Yeah. Gresham's law. Yeah, thank you so much. So I ended up going about it a different way. I didn't sell a, well, I did sell a bunch of my growth stocks. Uh, what I did not do was, uh, was, was utilize them to purchase a vehicle. I did not know I was still muted. You do now. Uh, yeah, T-Dub actually points out something uh, for me. He says that uh, you can load the, uh, the card with cash, not just crypto. So you can uh, ostensibly forward cash to it, spend it, and then earn, use it to earn the cash back. So oh, that's that makes pretty sense, neat. I guess. Yeah. Although to me, primarily its use would be to maybe send a little bit of crypto to it every once in a while in order to spend, you know, some of those mad gains out in the world. Right. Yeah, it does make it does make it pretty convenient. Like for example, let's say you're uh you know, let's say you know, your dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin and you you know, you mostly just hold on to it, but you're out for vacation or you know, you're out, you know, getting dinner one night. And, you know, you kind of look at your phone and you're like, oh, man, Bitcoin just hit 11,000. Uh, I'll pay with the MCO card tonight, you know, because why not? Right. You know, you, you, you distribute when price is up. To a truck. Of course, it's four wheel drive, man. I live I, I live in a place that has seasons. For MCO, can what? we buy it on Binance and transfer? Yes, yes, you can. What you, are these? seasons right uh you can you can purchase your mcl on any exchange and tr jack you'll have to clear you know just just correct me where i go stray here you can transfer into your crypto.com wallet from any other crypto address right from yeah, mco that's my understanding yep that's exactly how you can do it but i also know you can attach credit cards to the mco wallet and pay directly for the mco tokens through your credit card in the app What's, can you, just, just, uh, just out of curiosity, you, would you mind just pulling up your phone real quick and telling me, maybe they'll tell you like what the, what the, what the price is. They give you like the average market price. If you were to purchase it with your credit card at the moment. Um, sure. But I'm currently uh, in Canadian dollars. So keep that in mind. But, uh, last time I looked at it, it was giving me a 
pretty much a damn damn close rate to what with the, the spot, spot trade. Yeah. It seemed pretty damn close last time I looked at it, so it didn't seem like they were charging me much of a premium, if any. But uh, let me just pull it up right now and get back to you in a sec. Beth got stuck on one of my transfers. Yeah, tell me about it. I got like six Ethereum that are qu that are queued in MetaMask right now. They've been queued since last night. Well, I guess I haven't checked this morning, but... Yeah, according hey. to mycrypto.com uh, right now, it's about 200 as, bucks. That's as, 50 as, as Guter Jungler, Jungler, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce your name, but listen, man, you, you do not have to rush out this second and buy MCO. This this dip, I'm sure it's going to last over the weekend if you need to wait until Monday to purchase it. Uh, as a matter of fact, we may even get another low beyond this. Uh, we're we're kind of hoping we do. So if it, school banks are closed, you don't, you, know, you just wait a couple of days and, uh, you know, just like we were talking about here, if, you know, if it's a good buying opportunity, you, you've got more than just one single day to purchase it. So. And I will say, I, I absolutely agree with Alex, right? Like I just laid out my plan. Like I bought like $500 with the MCO this morning. Um, I will probably buy, uh, I will probably go ahead and grab about 500 or 2000 USD around these price levels. If price drops to around $3, I might double that. Um, if price drops even lower, I might double that. I like MCO quite a bit and I'm a little late on it, but, um, although I, I do have a little bit, but not, not a, not a large, large amount, just back from back in the day on Binance as a trophy trade. Um, mm -hmm. but what you can do, I mean, don't definitely don't need the banks to be open. Cause I'm not aware of any place that you can go and pay in cash, except for if you met somebody online PTP, but you can download their app right now on your phone and pay with your credit card and buy MCO that way. You can go to binance.com and deposit. I already suggested Binance. He yep. doesn't want to have to do KYC or anything like that, I think. Well, you're going to have to do KYC for crypto.com, I believe. Yeah, the when you launch the app, before you can do anything, you got to complete KYC and we'll let it process first. So, yep. you know, which is one reason why maybe I might want to keep my uh, not want to send any crypto directly to the MCO wallet. Um, you know, maybe just attaching my credit card and paying with that, I can kind of keep everything in its own little KYC bubble on crypto.com for its purposes, if that makes sense. Because, you know, if I send like, you know, Bitcoin from my address or if I send MCO from Binance or somewhere onto my crypto.com wallet, now there's like a bit of a trail that links my MCO KYC identity to maybe an exchange where I, I don't well, have any You're trying KYC to complaint. avoid the chain analysis, man, you're probably screwed. Yeah, no doubt, but uh, it's still something I think about, right? And if it, okay. and if uh, if they're not charging really any kind of premium over spot, you, you know, then it seems simple as hell for me. I mean, my credit card's already attached to the app right now, so it's just a matter of clicking checkout, and I've, they got 200, 200 bucks worth of MCO on my account or more. So just something to think about, guys. You know, if you're, if you're trying to weigh between attaching a credit card or sending from your exchange, uh, you know, maybe maybe with KYC considered, you kind of want to avoid that but maybe inevitable if you're going to plan to send all types of crypto to this card for spending sooner or later anyway so mm -hmm. um so let's do yeah and crow is is just up incredibly so uh a couple things that i wanted to do earlier someone had requested um I, what's, Dana? What's, yes uh ada usdt someone asked about xrp um and they also asked about zil and vet Okay. Um, so I don't really have a strong opinion on ADA USDT. This logically looks like a distribution zone, so I would expect lower prices um, in the macro, like let's say next two to three months. Um, but it is, but ADA and USD, ADA USDT is going to move with the broader crypto market. So if US, if if USDT markets, and that means BTC USD, uh. Uh, moves up, then we will see a breakout following this consolidation. But we are in a consolidation zone. Uh, if you want to attempt to play this range, that's fine. I see logical support right around the 7.3 to 7.2 area, and I see logical resistance around the 8.6 to 8.8 .8 area. So those are areas that you could range trade horizontal support and resistance buy and sell combined with the potential momentum oscillator indicator. But I don't see any attractive setups coming out of this, except for a potential trend break short if we were to get that uh, impetus, which would honestly most likely be the trade I would be looking at if we can get 
probably down below seven cents. Yeah, would be my thoughts. It is also a lot stronger here than the other major alts have been. You know, uh, most of them haven't haven't taken off yet. There hasn't been the interest in it that there has been for Ada. I think a lot of that has to do with uh, Charles Hoskins. Hopkins? Hoskins? Yeah, Hoskins. Uh, Hoskins, uh, the founder of Ada. He seems to have like formed a marketing partnership with Justin Sun. And ever since they started hanging out, Charles Hoskins has just been like killing it with marketing hype. I swear, it's like he calls up Justin. He's like, what should I tweet today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He has definitely so, uh, been far more um, uh, savvy. Savvy, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A lot of people consider Justin Sun to be an unsavory character, though. So uh, you know, with that said, uh, this doesn't always doesn't look good for. Hey, for hey, Hoskinson hey, hey! In that regard. tokens pump the hardest. <laughs> it's exactly video? because of that unsavory behavior of Justin that I feel like, hey, it's probably gonna pump more. Have you seen that video of Justin's son at the uh, resort, all drunk and stuff, talking about the, the coins that he's shilling? No, I haven't, but the, I imagine the guy, he must think people are pretty fucking stupid. He's, a pretty, uh, pretty, he's quite a lightweight when it comes to, to drinking, so somebody caught him on camera asking him about, um, about uh, Tron and all that, and he was quite forthcoming, calling it, you know, it's a shit coin, I'm only here to scam you, <laughs> not so many words. Yeah. Pie guy, he uh he said he dumped his Ada Holt once Justin Sun and Hoskinson started hanging out. Friends, they'll be friends, they're running naked in the sand. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I uh I agree. Um yeah. however Ada is strong. Probably nine yeah, so I, I would lean so we're at resistance, so I'm gonna just logically lean more bearish, but you know, if we mm -hmm. get if we get a continuation out of here and most likely I mean we can see nine cents has represented some pretty good horizontal resistance here, that's gonna bring in some some big volume. But you know, the the reason that concerns me is that, you know, we're you know, we're we're in this range, we've come up against resistance, we've got the big buy volume spike uh precedent to this. And we're going to see low volume distribution followed by big volume spikes, and they seem to begin to be coming in. But again, I'm not going to. I know what light, 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 what what price is likely to do, not when it's going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I would say if we can get above nine cents and we get more bullish volume coming in, then we can certainly continue. That nine cents has been a barrier since uh, September of 2018. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is such a strong area of resistance. I'd like to see maybe just like a slightly stronger pullback. Maybe to that, uh, maybe retest that previous swing high again. You know, uh, the one uh, right before April. I was just thinking, you know, something that we used to do, we used to do this back in like 2018 was, um, you know, when we would do these chart requests, we would publish them on TradingView, right? And like put the notes in of like what we thought and then we would revisit them. I think that's a good idea. We should start doing that again. <sighs> you know... There, there are reasons that I have not been doing that. Um, well, my understanding is just it's just kind of not as professional. Do, you know, every time I hear accusations about someone not being like a real professional trader, it's like, oh well, you know, they post their trade setups online and stuff like that. What? What kind? What kind of professional trader posts their trade setups online? Um, Me. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, I don't know. Change the game. Well, that's why I've kind of gotten away from it. You know, I mean, I put it up for I put it up in the group and stuff like that. But I just, you know, I tend not to put my trade setups on Twitter and stuff for those reasons. Yeah, I mean, I I, I don't either. I I think maybe I have maybe a fundamental same com you know same kind of same yeah. thinking but what i will say is it, it's not so much for the it's certainly not for exposure it's it's more so people can reference what i said if they're interested in my my opinion yeah. who are watching the show so that that's there in perpetuity and so that people can hold me accountable to what i say right so let's say we're here on cardano i'm like yeah i'm like pretty bearish but maybe if we break nine cents i'll be bullish and then like Monday I come on and I'm like, guys, remember how I was really bullish on Cardano on Monday, on Friday, and we pumped over the weekend? Yeah, I hope you took that call. And that allows, you know, the viewers the opportunity to be like, no, 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 listen, Justin, 
you said on Friday that you were bearish. So don't be coming in here on Monday yeah. with your snazzy suit and your gold watch saying how you called this move. Yeah, I, I do like the um, the accountability aspects of, of putting up the trades. But, you know, one danger is that you know, something that you and I know, but maybe that's someone who it, it is newer to looking at technical analysis and stuff like that. If In this business, if you're right, like 60 65 percent of the time you are killing it mm -hmm. boom this guy is one of the best traders ever he's right 65 percent of the time um and i and i think when people come across a chart that you've put up and they respect you as a trader i i've seen i've seen it so many times where someone will will rush into a trade that i, I post this up and they're like oh my gosh you know this is this is phenomenal and yes this looks good to me uh, I mean, well, first of all, it looked good to me. Also, that's why I put it up. But, you know, I mean, these people, they have faith in the things that I put up, maybe even more so than I have faith in it, because I, I know that I'm, like, only right 65% of the time. Um, I, I don't know. I just, I, I, I worry about uh, what people are going to do with information like that that, you, that I put out there. You know, I worry about our, our members. I worry about our non-members. I worry about anybody who's trading. Yeah, I agree. That's, so that's why I have I, I, I have reservations and stuff like that. But I think, here here's my opinion mm -hmm. on that. What I think is, that is something that we will never, ever, ever be able to assuage. Because that is just the way that it is and always has been and always will be. You know, you know utilizing technical analysis and being a proficient trader requires a certain set of skills, requires a certain mentality, requires risk management, emotional discipline... Um, a routine and you know a trade style and um, you know there are always going to be new novice traders wandering in and blundering in and making mistakes and not adopting a systemic system because their public school system didn't tell them to do that they don't know how to do research they don't know how to ask questions they don't know how to be humble and at the end of the day we can't solve the world's problems because that's not really a problem in trading that's a problem with education in general and how um, typically newer individuals or large portions of the population approach new tasks and the learning process in general and taking all that into account if i had to rank order the effectiveness of one of of, of a new trader coming across my charts and therefore my links and our educational material and our channel and all i mean the thousands of hours of free content and education and setups and disclaimers and 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 all the talk we do about all of the things that i just mentioned that they can find on our website and our discord on our youtube on our twitch everywhere across that i would rather have that i would rather have that chart out there number one on trading view and have new traders come across and encounter that than something by let's say crypto kirby or the moon or burb or something like that a hundred percent i mean i think you i think you raise a good point i just I don't know. I just, it's something that always gives me pause. And, you know, a lot of times when I think about throwing up a chart onto Twitter or something like that, I think, eh, you know, I'll just, uh, I'd just rather put it in the group for the members and stuff like that. And Air high five. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. We're not disagreeing, sir. Yeah. Um, let's see here. All right. So, buy Bitcoin, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, Zill, Vet, um, that's right, Zerp. Zerp? Zerp. Zerp. All right. Zerp, Bitcoin. I think I finally got that reaction off the bottom I was looking for. All right, let's do it. Yeah. Um, Zill, BTC, I'm assuming. Did not get instantly stopped out on this XRP Bitcoin trade like the last two. This, so, there's that. This one will be different. <laughs> <laughs> Wee! Um, uh, let's look at okay so Zilliqua Bitcoin uh, let's see you're coming off of a retrace and kind of feeling like it wants to take another step down here on Zill uh, I'm going to definitely need some time I don't feel like really taking any behaviors on Zill here until I can see if this area resolves or not let's see what the indicators are telling us to do 
I uh, like the decreasing bearish volume. I, I do feel like we're starting to get to the point where if if you bought it in this area, you you wouldn't be sorry. It's just the question is how long are you gonna have to hold on to it? Like what's the opportunity cost if you bought right here? Yeah. Um so this pullback makes sense. I would like to see price get above like 230 sats again before I start looking for continuation, honestly, at this point in time for mm -hmm. like, let's say a next wave, because we are dangerously close to starting to get initial short signals here on my Donchian system. Not yet, um, but getting there. Uh, certainly uh, time transformation is bearish. True strength is bearish, but money flow is still in the green, which makes sense because we just had a cr incredible run. Remember how I wanted to short it at 300? We just never made that second high that I wanted to catch. catch. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's too, that's just a shame. Uh, VeChain, I looked at VeChain earlier. It didn't necessarily excite me. I yeah. think we're still under resistance on VeChain, and I'd like to see maybe one more pullback. If, if you can, buy it below 90. Do buy, buy it below 90. I see, uh, I see Vets next leg go into about 150, 120 at least. So, yeah, I could agree with that. Yeah, yeah, I would say, uh, I would say overall the chart is bullish. Time transformation signal for an exit here and here, and we really just haven't gone anywhere. Our our confirmer has crossed it. <laughs> Chris Ventures, thank you so much for the third resub, my friend. Hopefully, I got that right. And let me go check Twitch. Yeah, thank you so much for the, uh, or did you, so I don't know if you, yeah, no, no, no. This is your third month on Twitch as a subscriber. Thank you so much, my friend. Highly appreciated. And hey, guys, back to you. Uh, oh, yeah, I am contractually obligated every time somebody subscribes to mention that, hey, if you guys got Amazon Prime and you're not supporting anybody on Twitch, you can support this channel for zero dollars, you just click that Amazon Prime button, you get one free Twitch subscription. And everybody's got Amazon Prime. Don't lie to me, you know. Even if you watch this on YouTube, just go over to Twitch and give us a sub and then forget about it. You can still watch this on YouTube. Still watch this on YouTube. Yeah. Saying, saying. All right, and uh, XRP BTC. Derp. Um... Hey, there comes Ron Legato with the five-month resub as well. Thank you so much, my brother. Long-time supporter, Mr. Legato. Thumbs up to you as well, my friend. Let's see. Um, uh, let's see here. What? Um, yeah, so we've got uh, kind of the second in a row. Uh, Time transformation buy signal, which I somewhat like as a reversal. We we do we have formed a um, we have formed a higher low on the money flow oscillator on this recent low and are uh, chugging back up. And I think overall that's a pretty good thing. We did not reach an extreme low. Do we have? We've got a little bit of. Uh, 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 I would call this like type C bullish divergence because it's equidistant. Mm. I think you're right. That's type C divergence. It's a nice little wedge we've got here pattern. Yeah. And, and in fact, I mean, to be quite frank, I mean, just looking at the indicators, the thing that would be holding me back from this is money flow. But I can see true strength about to cross over and resistance for me is only here. Um, at uh, uh, 2,061 sats. Thank you so much, Harmonic Beast, for the sub over there on Twitch. Highly appreciated. You guys are crushing it. Thank you so much for all the support. You guys don't know how much it means. You really do. We got about double the Twitch uh, viewers that we ever do. We've got, we got a huge amount today. Hard light XRP reversal hype. Look, I'm even going to drop some... Uh, uh, I'm even going to drop some... some Wait, let's see here. Where's my gold? Where's the gold coins? Ah, here we go. Boom. There we go. Drain some gold coins up in here. So while, oh, by the way, uh, D Live. Let's not. Uh, I see. I see. I see. Pi 
uh, piping up it over on, on DLive. I know that he's likely not going to let that stand. Uh, well, ha thanks so much for the bits, Briz. Highly appreciate it, my brother. All right, we got to do DLive too. Let's distribute some rewards over there on this beautiful Friday. Having a good day. I, I got to, you know, unfortunately, I got to like, I got to roll, guys. This is 154. There's so much that I got to get done today. Ah, we're on a roll, though. I know, I know, I know. Hey, Justin, let me ask you real quick. Did you uh, happen to uh, try out that ETH Prime? Uh, so I, yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good segue. Um, I like the, I like the ETH Prime interface. I, uh, I'm not done doing all of my diligence on it, but I did go to just put, you know, a nominal amount of F on there just to kind of play with it. And what, uh, I wasn't able to deposit my, my funds due to network congestion last night. So like I said, I have about three transactions that are still queued in MetaMask. And some are for Uniswap. Some uh, one is for two are for Uniswap, and one is for F Prime. And they were queued before I went to bed last night. I don't know if they've actually gone through. I'll check it uh, later on this afternoon. But yeah, I let's say I attempted to. Sweet, sweet, sweet. So, and uh, I was thinking that would be you know after after a few days, um, after a few days of um, of kind of playing with it. I would, uh, you know, we could talk about it on the on the stream. So hopefully Definitely. sometime right, next cool. week. Cool, cool. And I don't know. I got now. I got to see where that came in at. Uh, it was. It was uh, Robert Pack. Thanks so much for the sub over there on YouTube. All right, man. It is almost two o'clock, guys. Good live stream for the Friday, but we got it. We got to wrap it up. Uh, closing thoughts for the weekend, uh, Mr. Alex. Trade safely, guys. I would, you know, I would just, Bitcoin's probably just going to go sideways a whole lot more. I would avoid taking out large positions on, on Bitcoin and instead look to the alts. Uh, see, see what maybe has consolidated and might be looking to make new highs. If something is broken resistance and is consolidating above resistance now support, take a closer look at that. You know, that's, um, you know, anybody who's been watching me trade the alt markets for the past month and a half, that's, you know, class side. If, you're, if your system is signaling along right as resistance is being broken, it's like, come on, it's a give me. Let's take that trade. You know, you're not going to be right every single tr time, but that's probably, you know, some of the best directional bias you're going to get on a trade. That's my thought. Good stuff, man. Peace out, guys. Have a great weekend. Uh, Jack, anything from you? Sure. Uh, no, everybody uh, have a good weekend. Stay safe and uh, try not to get wrecked. Sounds good, man. Thank you guys for all the support. R. Dagan, thank you so much for those kind words. And we're going to go over to the outro. I'll see you guys in a bit. Uh, Discord off. Okay. Ooh, boy. All right, let's roll. Let's do this together. Thank you guys so much for joining me for another episode of Breaking Bitcoin Market Update brought to you as always by the Cracking Cryptocurrency Premium Trading Group. If you guys would like to join our professional community of mentors, teachers, and just in general traders, I guess. I biffed it there. Uh, you guys can head over to the link in the description, premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com. Take advantage of our premium indicator suite, our community, and one-on-one -on -one mentoring, um, our online trading academy involving the Pathways to Profit course, uh, risk management, all the things that we have put on there and that we have yet to come to go on there, uh, as well as our, I mean, just, just really awesome community. And whatever you do, uh, if that's not for you, make sure to join our Discord free community. Anybody can join it. It's the best place to be, discord.crackingcryptocurrency.com. We will be back on Monday at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time, but stay tuned for some awesome Breaking Bitcoin bits coming up over the weekend, keeping you guys updated on what is going on. If you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, sarcastic remarks, and or death threats, leave them in the comment section down below. We'll do our best to respond to them. We do respond to all of our comments. If you guys enjoy the content, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and support our, uh, you know, like basically what we do here, right? So you guys uh, do make it all possible. So thank you guys so much. Have an incredible weekend. Uh, in general, um, I am certainly leaning more uh, bearish than bullish in the macro as I went through. I went through over an hour of technical analysis today, uh, and that's pretty much across the board. Um,
kind of the worst scenario, obviously, coming in as a second wave of lockdowns. That's particularly difficult here for America, where policymakers have to balance the difference between the country burning down due to civil unrest and increased lockdowns to reduce COVID deaths, which will certainly, uh, I think the latter will cause more of a financial catastrophe than the former, honestly. So hard times, difficult decisions ahead. Uh, and so for the individual, which is all that we can control, we look to maintain our financial sovereignty make careful investment decisions, and begin reallocating risk. And by the way, find a way to get long volatility, guys. Uh, I will be back on Monday. You guys have a fantastic weekend. Look forward to talking to you all in Discord. And as always, trade safely. Cheers, guys.